Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Matt 1841. Hopefully, you guys had a good reading week. So we are approaching sort of the last seg segment of the semester. And um, we're going to be starting to talk about some things that are a little bit further out there, but uh, are still quite cool mathematically. So we'll be building up to learning about persistent homologies and uh, uh, this week. And we might talk a little bit more about some other more advanced techniques in topological data analysis next week. Uh, it'll depend on how timing goes, of course. But in order to do this, we do need to spend some time and just build up the vocabulary. If you've taken an algebraic topology class, much of this will be reviewed, but I'm not assuming that background. And so we will go through the preliminaries that we need. Uh, we won't be proving everything because, well, that would involve teaching a topology class, but we will be trying to uh, get enough of the machinery so that we can talk uh, precisely about things like persistent homologies. Uh, let's see. So these are, uh, are based off of some notes from Melissa McGurls, as well as uh, the book by Elders Brenner and uh, her. <clears throat> um, they're both linked to on the website, and they're both also available as PDFs online. Um, uh, the Elders Brenner and her textbook is actually one of the standard texts in the in the field. So, like, if if you're particularly interested in this area, that's where you should go to look. Um, but yeah, so let's go ahead and get <clears throat> started, and we'll just get started uh, with some basics, and we'll just start by defining combinations of points. So we're going to take uh, start a little bit more geometrically, and then we're going to move over to abstract simplicial complexes. So uh, let's see. This is definition three point one uh, in the notes from uh, most of my girls, uh, and so we're going to consider a set of points, uh, and we're going to consider affine and convex combinations of them. Set of points, say u i for i equals zero to n. So finite set of points. Uh, then we can define an affine combination. It's just going to be uh, some linear combination of these. Does that flicker? Okay. Anyway, a linear combination, oh, sorry, an affine combination is a point X that some linear combination of all these points such that the sum of all these coefficients lambda I is equal to one, um, I equals zero to N. And we have uh, a convex combination which additionally imposes the condition that all of the, coefficient, all of the um, coefficients lambda are positive. <clears throat> so uh, basically the same setup, such that all these coefficients, all the least sums are equal to one and our lambda i is a greater than equal to zero for all i. And of course, then we can define uh, affine and convex holes. And so those will take the standard definitions, just basically all the points that are affine combinations or the respectively convex combinations. Uh, affine and convex holes. And we'll just uh, use this notation affine of zero, uh, u naught through u n is just the set of all x that are such that x is an affine combination. Combination of are UIs and uh, the convex combination, which same thing, except there are obviously going to be is a convex combination. And uh, let's draw a couple pictorial examples. So uh, actually, I think I'm going to use green for my examples in this lecture. So if you have uh, two points in uh, the 2D plane, let's say we have two points here, one point, one point. Well, the, the, the convex hull of these two points uh, is going to be this region in between them. And the affine hull is going to include all this region out here, affine hull of the same two points. Um, and if you have, have a couple more points, so one thing, let's say I have four points in 2D here, the convex hull is going to be this region over here, so that's the convex hole. Whereas the affine hole is going to be basically R, all of R2. Affine hole. Okay, so you're just taking these points and you're uh, adding them together as linear, some linear combination <coughs> with some conditions. Um, and we can also define what it means for points to be affinely independent. So U naught through UN are affinely independent, independent if and only if the n vectors, so note that we had n, n plus one points, but so if the n vectors 
um, ui minus u naught. Of course, u naught isn't special. You can do this for, it doesn't matter which of those you choose, but if ui minus u naught for uh, greater than or equal to one, less than or equal to n are linearly independent. So that's in the standard linear algebraic sense of linearly independent. And uh, one thing that you'll notice is that, oh, sorry, wrong color. One thing you'll let you notice is uh, in RD, well, of course, we have at most D plus one uh, affine the independent points. The independent points, because you have at most uh, N uh, linearly independent vectors. And so you can think of the affine independence as, um, is it linear independent once you've uh, like set some point as your zero point. So basically we're sending you a zero, uh, you not as your origin and looking at everything else as a vector going from there. Uh, so somehow when we're talking about the affine independence, we're not privileging any zero point. We're just saying that given the set of points, if you assume any one of them is the zero point are the re remainder of the points that are the independent as vectors. Okay, so now that we have all of this formalism, so that we can define simplex. So a K simplex, is the convex hole of K plus one affine the independent points. Uh, so sigma is, uh, where sigma is the K simplex is equal to the con um, convex hole of U naught through U N. And then the dimension of sigma as a simplex is going to be equal to N. So this would be an N simplex uh, if all those points are affine the independent to begin with. And uh, well, um, let's start with the easiest example. What's the easiest example of a simplex by these definitions? Yeah, just the point. So uh, this here is a zero simplex, a zero simplex. Uh, and we can go and have more complicated things so, like this here is a one simplex. Um, so it's a convex hull, so we need to include that. So that's a one simplex. Um, and we can have a two simplex. So that's this region here. So filled in triangle, so that's a two simplex. Uh, and of course, uh, if you allow, if our ambient space is big enough, you can have higher simplex syntheses, such as, let's see if I can draw this. Mm. So uh, for example, um, imagine that's filled in. So that's a filled in tetrahedron, so then that's a three simplex. Uh, so that's the tetrahedron and so on as your embedding face goes up. And it's useful to talk about faces of these uh, simplexes. And in fact, they'll turn out to be elder simplexes of lower dimension. So uh, given uh, sigma is the convex hole of U naught through U N, uh, we'll assume that all these points are uh, affine the independent for now. Um, obviously if they aren't then you just reduce your simplex to remove all the points that aren't affine the independent. Uh, a face, and I think I called these tau. The face tau of sigma uh, denoted tau is less than or equal to sigma uh, is tau, which is a convex hull of some set of points u i one through u i m, where u i one through u i m is a subset of u naught through u n. Okay, and uh, we'll call it a proper face if, well, uh, tau is a proper face if the size of the, if the dimension of uh, tau is lower than the dimension of uh, sigma. So is a proper face. Proper face if m is less than n. So let's give a couple of examples of these things. So uh, let's start with our tetrahedron again. So we have well, this is clearly uh, greater than in the sense that it contains the base, which is just the base down here. So if you had just the base, uh, which is of course contains the face that's just one of the uh, edges, which of course contains uh, each of those two points. 
Okay, so now that we've defined all of these different, uh, defined what simplexes are, we can define a simplicial complex. And know that this is a geometric simplicial complex, we'll define an abstract simplicial complex in a little bit. So uh, I think this is, uh, which definition? Oh, I think I had numbers for these. I think that was supposed to be 3.5. So these are in the uh, notes um, that we're uh, following. Um, though some of the theorems are proving that they aren't in those notes and are from Ada's printer. Uh, let's see, the definition 3.6. What is a simplicial complex? So a simplicial complex, simplicial complex is a finite connection of simplices, of simplices K, such that there are a couple of important conditions. So the first condition is that if sigma is in K and tau is a face of sigma, then that implies that tau is in K. Okay, so if you include a simplex, you also have to include all of its faces. Well, that's not too, too difficult. Um, the second one is a little bit more complicated. So suppose you have two different simplexes that are both in K, then that implies that Euler, they don't intersect. So Euler sigma one intersects sigma two is equal to the empty set. Or if they do intersect, sigma one intersect sigma two, then that has to be a face of sigma one, and it has to be a face of sigma two. Okay, so let me write out a couple of examples and ask you if there are simplicial complexes. So let's start with something uh, easy. So let's say we have this here. Let's say that we have the two face there, and we have each of those. So this is a simplicial complex. Let me draw the couple uh, just so that we can. Discuss whether or not each of these is a, is a simplicial complex by the definition we just given. Which of these three are simplicial complexities. Okay, so we think the leftmost one. Well, why is that? Well, it's some collection of sim uh, simplexes, right? So we have, um, say, we have a bunch of zero simplexes. Those are easy. Those are just points. We have a bunch of lines. Those are um, <clears throat> one simplexes, and we have a single two simplex. Importantly, uh, when for this two simplex, all the one simplices, all of its sides, are also uh, drawn in. So this, yes, that is correct. This is a simplicial complex. Uh, what about this third one? That might be a little bit easier. So is the third one a simplicial complex? If not, why not? Exactly. So the faces aren't all present. Faces aren't present. Right? Because one of the, uh, the properties of a simplicial complex is that if you have a higher dimensional simplex, all of its faces have to also be in your simplicial complex. Um, what about this one here, the little middle one? Uh, yes. So it violates condition two because it has some intersection that isn't a face. So if you look at, say, um, the simplex that's this line here, and this two simplex here, those intersect. Um, but the intersection there is some line segment that isn't one of your faces or that isn't one of your simplices. So this violates condition two. And so this is a intersection that is not a face. Oh yeah, sure. Um, let me draw in a moment. So this here is the intersection between two of your uh, simplices, right? That line segment there. But that blind segment isn't one of the simplexes uh, in the uh, simplicial complex. Um, or, I mean, you could also uh, look at, say, this point here, since that point's also the intersection of two of your lines, right? And so, if this were a simplicial complex, and that itself, that simplex, that zero simplex, would also have to be in your set of simplices. Okay, so, uh, and that one there as well. And so, you have an intersection that isn't a face. So, now well, this is all because we have some real geometry. Right? So like we've defined these simplex, uh, simplexes, uh, but they're all floating around in some ambient space and sometimes they can intersect in weird ways. Um, of course, this idea of a simplicial complex of where you contain all of your uh, faces and you have uh, interesting intersections can also be abstracted. And oftentimes uh, we discuss this in the, a little bit more abstractly. Uh, so this is definitely 3.7 and we sort of lose all the geometry associated with it. And that actually makes the conditions a little bit easier to uh, consider. 
So an abstract simplicial complex, an abstract simplicial complex <coughs> is a finite collection of sets of sets A such that alpha in A and beta contained in alpha. So remember, this is a collection of sets. So A is a set of a bunch of sets. So if alpha is one of the sets in A and B and beta is a subset of alpha, of alpha that implies that beta is also in A. Okay, so this corresponds to this condition up here of um, things being subsets, uh, of faces being subsets, right? Or uh, yeah, of the faces, uh, which if you, you can think about each of these simplices as being defined by all the, uh, uh, all the zero dimensional points, right? Uh, by its uh, sort of edges the uh, affine the independent of vectors. And if you just think of those as abstractly as sets, well, if you have some simplex that's defined by a set of n uh, points, well, you can think of all of its faces as just all the things that are defined by some subset of those. And so all we're claiming here is that we have some uh, set, uh, set of sets, and whenever you have one thing in your set, all of its subsets are also in your uh, collection A. Now, one of the things that you might notice is that when we do this abstractly, so we, <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. When you do this abstractly, you don't have to worry about these weird intersections anymore. <clears throat> because if you have an intersection of two sets, well, clearly the intersection of two sets is going to be a subset of <coughs> one of the original sets. And so you don't have to worry about uh, these uh, weird, uh, weird cases, uh, weird cases like that. <clears throat> Okay, so this is part of the setup. So we'll be using simplicial complexes a lot. But now we also have to ask, well, these simplicial complexes, the, these are some weird like algebraic uh, object, right? How do these relate to like our data sets? So like here, we're going to be talking about some topological data analysis. <clears throat> and one of the things you have to do is you have to go from some set of points in some space or maybe a topological space itself over into the sort of abstract simplicial complex so that you can then use techniques uh, from say homology on the original data set. And to do this, we need to talk a little bit about topological spaces and covers of those spaces as ways of sort of translating from a, a space over to this sort of more combinatorial object. <clears throat> well, this will be definition 3.8. Uh, so those of you who have taken topology, which is hopefully most of you. Uh, so if we have a topological space, well, we can cover it. Let X be a topological space, so a cover of X is a collection. Oh, sorry, let me get the chat up in case people are asking questions since I haven't been looking at that. Okay, good, no questions in chat. <clears throat> so a cover of X is a collection of sets U. Uh, so I apologize for the sort of overload notation. UI is a one of the sets in our cover U um, for I in some index set. So this index set doesn't necessarily have to be finite. It doesn't necessarily have to be even, even countable. But so we're going to use this notation uh, such that X is contained in the union of all these uh, U's. In retrospect, using U for this letter is actually not so great because it sort of conflicts with like union, which almost looks the same. Please let me know if I get that wrong or if it's confusing at any point. OK, so we have this idea of a cover. <clears throat> and another one of the things we can talk about is the nerve of a cover. Of a cover. So this is sort of um, uh, well. Let me just define that. It'll be a little bit more obvious. So let's say that we have a cover. Uh, be a cover of some topological space X. <clears throat> the nerve of U. Let's uh, call that N of U. Well, that's an abstract simple complex. <clears throat> With the vertex set uh, I, where a family I naught through IK spans a K simplex. 
if and only if u sub i not intersects, if the intersection between all of these uh, u sub i not through u sub i k's is not empty. <clears throat> so what do we mean by that? Let's uh, illustrate it through an example. So suppose that we have some uh, uh, space here. I'm going to draw it out like this. Um, so let's have, uh, let me make that a little bigger. Okay, let's say that this, is, uh, this area has all of this filled in except for the hole I've cut out of it, okay? So this is some rectangle with a hole cut out of the center. <clears throat> um, let me erase that up because it'll get really messy otherwise. And let's say we're going to cover it with some collection of circles, okay? Uh, some collection of disks, not circles. Um, so let's say we have this uh, disk, this disk. Let's say we have this disk here. Uh, let's say we have this disk. Okay, so I covered it with a bunch of disks. <clears throat> and then the question is, how do we go from list? So we have some set. This is a finite set that is a cover of our uh, object. And well, we can think about how these, uh, all these disks connect to each other. And so the question is, do these disks actually connect to each other uh, with a non-empty intersection? So now uh, let's say we have this point here and this point here. Well, then yes, those two points do connect to each other. And so in, if we're drawing our simplicial complex, we're going to start with, uh, let's have those be our blue points. And we're going to connect them together because of this intersection there. Uh, oh, ah, uh, <clears throat> And uh, we can think about, oh, that was the wrong eraser. So we can think about having a point at each of these and look at how, how these intersect with each other. And so uh, if we're drawing these out, so we have another point there, 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 and there. Okay, and so over here we have, uh, let's see, let's connect the flat. And uh, notice actually, that all three of these disks there, they all have a mutual intersection, right? And so because of that, not only do those connect, but we're also going to have fill in. So we have this uh, two simplex instead of just the uh, one simplicities. Uh, that connects and that connects. Uh, let's see, what connects? And uh, we also have the same thing happening here. And I think we have the same things happening here. Uh, okay. So what we've now done is we've taken a, <clears throat> we've gone from a cover of a space and constructed the simplicial complex out of this cover. <clears throat> and uh, one of the, uh, so, we're not going to prove it, but there's a really nice theorem called the nerve theorem that basically says that the nerve of U and the union of the sets in U have the same homotopy type. Um, so let's go ahead and define homotopy. So uh, those of you taking topology will be familiar with things like homotopy, homology, and topological equivalence. These are all different ways of saying that two, topolo two topological spaces look like each other um, to differing, differing extents. So, you can still have two, uh, two different uh, topological spaces that have the same homotopy type or the same homologies um, and have them be different. But if the two uh, topological spaces are equivalent to each other, then they must have the same uh, homotopy type, uh, et cetera. Uh, let's go ahead and define this just in case you guys don't remember from topology uh, what homotopy, uh, homotopies are. Basically, there's some way of formalizing the idea of you guys have probably seen like the coffee cup into a donut. There's some way, different ways of formalizing these sorts of continuous deformations. And I won't go into too much more detail on that, but let's go ahead and define it just so that we're all on the same page. So first we're gonna define uh, continuous maps and we're gonna say whether two maps are homotopic and that will allow us to say whether two spaces are of the same homotopy type. So if we're given continuous maps, <clears throat> F and G between X and Y, then a homotopy between F and G is another continuous map that continuously deforms between the two. So this map is from X cross the interval zero one to Y. <clears throat> 
such that f of x is equal to h of x zero and g of x is equal to h of x one for all x and x. <clears throat> okay, so our h is just a continuous mapping, a uh, continuous transformation of our map f to our map g. So if there, such a map exists, if such a map h, h exists, then we call uh, f and g, uh, f is homotopic to g. So we're going to, topologists use a lot of different meaningful symbols whenever you're talking about the equivalences because there's so many different kinds of equivalences. So this is meaningful here, even though like whether or not I've used, they haven't been meaningful in the uh, prior in this class, but they will be meaningful here. So um, f and g are homotopic, then call f and g homotopic. <clears throat> on two topological spaces, on two topological spaces, uh, let's say X and Y are homotopy equivalent if there are continuous maps, continuous maps F from X to Y and G from Y to X, such that G of F uh, is homotopic to the identity on X and F of G <clears throat> is equivalent to the identity on Y. Uh, homo uh, is homotopic to the identity on Y. So this is not quite as strong as an inverse, but it's not saying that they're actually equal to the uh, inverse map. That would be a much stronger condition. <clears throat> but this is just saying that um, uh, the, they're close to equivalent in, in some well-defined sense. Um, Note that homotopy is a stronger notion than homology, which we'll discuss later. Um, turns out that homotopy is unfortunately kind of hard to compute. Um, but it is a, uh, we a weaker notion than actual topological equivalence, uh, saying that two spaces are basically the same. Um, that's incredibly hard to compute. And if you're a topologist, you would understand why. Uh, however, homologies are relatively easy to compute. And so that's eventually what we'll work on. Um, but we're defining this now so that we can state the NERV theorem, which I said a little bit earlier. So this is 3.1, this is the nerve theorem. <clears throat> Which is that if we have, uh, let you be a finite collection, collection of closed convex sets. So closed and convex are both quite important here uh, in a Euclidean space. In space, then the nerve of you and the union of the sets themselves, union of the sets in U, have the same homotopy type. Okay, so basically this is saying that you can sort of approximate um, uh, this cover of a topological space with its abstract simplicial complex. They have the same homotopy type, which is quite important. Uh, but of course, um, we still need to construct the appropriate cover, right? So now we've sort of shifted the burden of like the work away from, oh, well, once you have some cover, well, then there's some equivalence, right? Well, of course, you still have to construct the cover and there are trivial ways of constructing covers that don't tell you very much about the space. Um, you could just have a single set, that's your entire space. And that is a closed cover. A cl um, it's not necessarily convex, but it is a closed cover, but it doesn't tell you very much about it. And so a lot of the, uh, it's important to come up with efficient ways of covering uh, your space. Uh, so let's go ahead and define a, uh, a uh, thing called the check complex, which includes a nice way of covering your space. Though it turns out that this is a little bit hard to compute. With. And so people don't usually compute with check complexes, but it's uh, going to be easier for us to discuss uh, what it means. So this is uh, 3.10. This is the check complex. And I'm probably mispronouncing it because I I'm terrible with names. Uh, so if we're going to let X be a finite set of points, finite set of points in R to the D. And for each point, uh, X and X, we're going to have a ball around it. So we're going to let D sub R of X uh, be equal to the all points that are within distance 
<coughs> r of x. Uh, and this is going to be a closed ball. So this is just the ordinary closed ball centered at x, uh, centered at x with radius r. Uh, well, radius po positive radius. Um, so the check complex uh, of x uh, and r, so it depends on both, is the nerve of the set of balls. Uh, that is to say that check of x r is equal to all sigma contained in x. So all subsets of x <clears throat> such that the intersection of the um, all the points in all the balls centered at points in sigma is non-empty. Okay, so now you, you uh, so if you remember back to when I did my really rough overview of all of uh, these different data science methods, I had some nice illustrations of like balls growing around points, right? And so you can sort of think of this as well, if we take a bunch of balls of the appropriate sizes around a field of data points, well, you can talk about the uh, simplicial complex that arises from expanding all these balls out to some radius r. And that's exactly what we're doing here with the check complex is we're taking uh, all these points, we're putting a little ball around them and expanding all their radii at the same rate. And then instead of talking about when they merge, we're just going to be looking instead at when they intersect with each other. Because of course that's related somehow to the sort of merged overall structure uh, in this very well-defined way because that we just uh, talked about the nerve theorem. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you repeat that? So once you've chosen a particular set of points to cover it, um, like in this particular case, once you've chosen a particular set of balls um, uh, and then you're looking at their intersections, yes, that's unique because, um, well, because the process for going from lat to the nerve is uh, completely deterministic. Um, however, you, if you were to choose slightly different uh, sets of points, um, so like the, the, this is only in this well, very well-defined setting. So now if you're thinking about some abstract space, so let's say that I have, uh, something like this, and uh, your cover is we're uh, just choosing some number of balls to cover it. Well, obviously, uh, lat's not going to necessarily have the same uh, nerve as, well, lat. Okay, does that sort of answer your question? You still look a little bit confused. Okay. But basically, the nerve of a cover is just the simplest of complex that arises directly from looking at the intersections of the um, sets in your cover. Right. So, so in that sense, it is, it is unique, um, but uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by the question. Okay, anyway, so now, uh, well, because closed balls, well, they are closed, right? Uh, and they are convex uh, and they are in your space. And so the nerve theorem applies. Um, and one other thing to keep in mind here is that the vertex set of the check complex, so all the uh, zero dimensional simplices of the check complex, are of course just the original points in X. Um, so that's by construction, since for every point in X, we're plopping down a zero vertex, and then we're constructing the uh, higher dimensional uh, simplices out of that. <clears throat> and I think we will, let's see, we have 15 minutes. Okay, so let's actually finish off with a, uh, hmm. I don't think we'll actually get to computing the tech complex today. Uh, in, but we're going to prove a related theorem that's important in being able to complete, compute the check complex. And this is a Helly's theorem. So uh, this is going to be useful later in computing the check complex. Um, and uh, it should be pretty obvious how this is applicable. So if we have any set that F be a finite collection, collection of closed convex sets, isn't R a real number? How do you have R subset X? Sigma. Oh yeah, well, that's a sigma. Uh, did I write an R somewhere? Oh, okay, yes, yeah. Uh, th thanks for that correction. That is a sigma. Yeah, yep. Okay, and that's an R. Yeah, well, please do let me know if the notation is confusing. And so this is X in sigma there, yep. <clears throat> Okay, so now let's suppose we have a collection of closed convex sets. 
uh, in R to the D. Uh, when Kelly's theorem states that every D plus one of the sets have a non-empty intersection. If and only if they all have a non-empty intersection. Okay, what do we mean by that? Because basically, um, if you're in an ambient space of dimension D and you have uh, a bunch of sets, so this can be many more than D plus one, uh, then the condition that all the sets intersect somewhere uh, is equivalent to saying that every group of D plus one sets also intersect somewhere. Um, so, well, an easy example in, two dimen uh, in one dimension, uh, if you have a set here, a set here, and a set here. So let's assume that those are all on top of each other. And in order for, uh, uh, if all three of them intersect, and so do all pairs, okay? That's sort of what we mean by this. It's obviously a little bit harder to visualize in higher dimensions. Um, and uh, well, but let's go ahead and prove it. And for this proof, we're going to use a similar technique to what we were doing last, wait, when did we, what were we doing last, what were we doing right before break? Um, yeah, PC dimension. So um, at some point I did a two-way induction, right? So I inducted over two different terms. Where this proof is actually gonna take this a very similar flavor to that. We're going to uh, prove this by induction over uh, two different parameters. So this is gonna take induction over D and the number of subs, a number of sets. N is, uh, let's say, let's call it N. Okay. And so let's discuss a couple of the base sets for the induction first, and then we'll show how the induction proceeds. So uh, well, let's take a look at a uh, easy base case. Let's, uh, so base case. Um, let's actually start with another one of the base cases because it's more interesting. Uh, or not more interesting, but uh, less interesting. Uh, so let's suppose that N is equal to D plus one. Why is it true for this case? Yes, it is entirely trivial because the statement is that every group of D plus one um, <clears throat> uh, every group of D plus one sets has an intersection if all of them have an intersection. Well, if you ex have exactly D plus one sets and there's only one group of D plus one sets and they must have an intersection. So this is trivial, uh, trivial by definition. Okay, and let me also give a, like depending on how you want to define things, this is either an irrelevant case or maybe it's a base case that's just trivially true. Um, if N is less than or equal to D, then this is also trivial or not meaningful because it's impossible to have D plus one sets. So this is not meaningful since impossible to have D plus one sets. And then now you, you can like, if this were a logic class, we might take some time and talk about what it means to like have a condition where like, it's just impossible for it to be true. We're not gonna do that. We're just gonna ignore that case because it doesn't matter. Um, okay, so those are uh, like a couple of the cases and um, Where am I? Let's uh, discuss a slightly more interesting case now. So uh, this is going to be another one of our base cases. Let's say that D is equal to one for all N. Okay, so this is, uh, this is now slightly non-trivial because we're basically saying that um, we're going to prove this in one dimension. And then we're going to use that induction on all the other dimensions. So in one dimension, well, what is a closed convex set in one dimension? Yeah, so convex sets on the real line, uh, closed convex sets on the real line are just closed intervals. Those intervals, I1 through IN, right? And so now we have two, uh, two different cases. We have the forward case, uh, actually, let's start with the backward case first. Why do I want to start with the backward case? So, uh, if uh, all sets intersect, well, that clearly means that all subsets have to have an intersection. Uh, when all subsets have 
the, the, all, all sets, how do I say this? Uh, if all groups of not all of them, so then all uh, subsets uh, also interest, sub collections, uh, sub collections. And note that this is true whatever dimension you're in. This is just a fact about set intersections. So we're not going to worry about this backward case. The important case is the forward case that if you have d plus one of them that intersect, if all groups of d plus one intersect, then so does all of them. So the forward case is the one that's interesting. Uh, oh, come back. So let's talk about the forward case. Well, if you're in B is equal to one, then all we're saying is that every pair of sets intersect, right? So the forward case is where we have every pair of intervals intersect. Okay, so if we let uh, I sub I, well, we can write each of these out explicitly is A I B I. Um, well, then we can explicitly give the intersection of all these sets, right? What is the intersection of a bunch of intervals? Well, Yep. Yeah, so just the max on the left and the min on the right. And if we know that the minimum over i, a, so the question is, is this um, uh, the, is this not empty? Well, uh, let's assume that, it, that this is an empty set. Well, this is an empty set. Uh, if the min of the, if the left-hand side is bigger than the right-hand side. Um, so if that were to be the case, then there would exist some AI greater than BJ for some I and J. But then those two wouldn't, wouldn't intersect. But then uh, I sub I intersect I sub J would uh, be equal to the empty set, a contradiction. Okay, so now we've proven it for a number of cases. Uh, what cases have we proven it for? Well, uh, let's draw, draw out the different parameters. So let's say one, two, three, four, five. So let's, those are our Ds. And let's say we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, and so on for all of our Ns. Well, what cases are, uh, have we proven? So we've proven this is true for all the cases where D is equal to one, right? So uh, let's see, this is this base case. So we've proven the truth for all D equal to one. We've also proven it to be true for exactly the set where n is equal to d plus one. So that would be less, 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 less. And we also know that all of these cases are uninteresting because those are the cases where you don't have enough sets to talk about anything. And so we just need to prove it to be true for this region over here, right? And so we're gonna do induction in much the same way where if we're, just, we're going to be, do induction on the assumption that we have the, the uh, case above it and the case to the left of it um, already proven. And if we can prove it uh, uh, based off of this two dimensional induction in that direction, then that'll prove it for well, all, all the interesting parts of the uh, parameter regime. So let's talk about the general case. And am I going to run out of time? I am probably going to run out of time, but let me try to finish this part of the proof at least. So the general case, uh, so suppose that there exists some n greater than d plus one closed convex sets in R to the d. Uh, and let's denote them uh, x1 through xn that form a minimal counterexample. And by this, we mean uh, that every d plus one of the sets has a common intersection, d plus one of these sets as a common intersection, but not all n of them. Common intersection, but not all n sets. Okay, and if you had a bigger counter example, you can just reduce it down to whatever the minimum uh, example is. And the, the minimality is actually important here because at some point we need to assume, we need to talk about the boundary of the transition point, basically. Yes, yeah, so uh, where, and, and it, it's the smallest type of set that satisfies all of this. Uh, okay, and let's explicitly talk about what our inductive hypothesis is. 
So our inductive hypothesis is that this is true. Uh, true for B n minus one and B minus one n. And B minus one n. Um, okay, let me just keep on going until we run out of time. And then we'll, we'll probably continue this proof uh, tomorrow. So we'll note by minimality and the inductive, and inductive hypothesis, Uh, if we let y n be equal to the intersection for i equal one to n minus one of x i, <clears throat> this is not empty um, because uh, we are assuming that this is the smallest possible example for n. And so, if you take away any one of your sets, then that's a set of size n minus one. And so, therefore, that must have a common intersection of all of the subsets of size d plus one. Subcollections of size d plus one have an intersection. So this is not empty, and we know that this is disjoint from Xn. Why is it disjoint from Xn? Because if it weren't disjoint from Xn, well, then you would, uh, you would it wouldn't be an example, a counter example at all. So now, now what we have is we have two convex sets that are disjoint from each other, so, uh, sitting somewhere, right? And if you have two convex sets that are disjoint from each other, what can you do? You can put a plane in between them, yes. So you can put a hyperplane in between them. So because yn and xn are closed and convex, there exists a d minus one dimensional hyperplane. Dimensional hyperplane, uh, let's call it h, separating lem and disjoint from both sets. Okay. And note that what we're doing now is we're going to reduce the problem down to d minus one dimensions because we also have the inductive hypothesis for d minus one dimensions, not just for n minus one in the d dimensions. So uh, let's let f prime be the collection, collection of sets. Zi is equal to xi intersect h for one less than or equal to i less than or equal to n minus one. Okay. So know that this is a collection that is in that's sitting in our uh, d minus one dimensional hyperplane. And uh, well, let's further note that each of our z i's is a non-empty d minus one dimensional closed convex set because by assumption. D of the first n minus one sets xi have a common intersection with our xn. And thus, that common intersection, intersection of D sets uh, contains points on both sides contains points on both sides of H. Well, since they intersect both YI uh, and XI. Okay, and now, now, let's, now we're almost done, right? So now what we've done is to reduce this problem down from uh, N and D to uh, N and D minus one. This, imp this implies that any D sets of ZI have a common intersection. But if you have any D sets of XI, you have a common intersection, then by the inductive hypothesis, since we're in the lower dimensional setting now, um, then that implies that the intersection of our uh, F prime is non-empty. Well, this is by induction. But we also know that the intersection of all of our f prime is just equal to the intersection over, I'm sorry, i equals zero, one to n minus one of our x i intersect h, which is equal to just y um, n intersect h, which is a contradiction because uh, originally we showed that your the hyperplane actually separates them. So this is a contradiction, contradiction. 
And that completes this proof because now we've proven that. Uh, so that finishes the proof of LA's theorem. And next time, so tomorrow, we're going to go back to using this to allowing us to compute the, to actually compute the check complex. So we'll actually give you an algorithm for explicitly computing the check complex of a set of points. Um, and that's where we'll get started tomorrow. Thank you all very much. And uh, I think that's the end of class for today. <laughs>